in Acts it said, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, it's talking about believers, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. And some of them, however, men from Cyprus, Cyprus and Cyrene, went on to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. Verse 21 says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And then it says Barnabas came to join them later on. And it said uh, he was glad and encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. And it says for a whole year Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Y'all remember that? The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Well, how did they get to Antioch? It said they had spread out after the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed. Y'all remember Stephen was stoned? And he looked up and he said, I see, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. You know what? I do want to pause for just a second. And I, I, I sometimes jest and joke, but I do, I do want to pray with, uh, pray with you guys this morning if that would be all right. Will you all pray with me also? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you and we thank you for your precious spirit. And we thank you for your words, Father, that bring life. Lord, I just pray that today as we as we go into your word, Lord, that you would just reveal to us something more than our own understanding, that you would just give us a supernatural revelation of your word to us, Lord, that we would hear you clearly, that we would, that we would know you, that we would acknowledge you, that you would speak to every one of us and let us know today that we are your children and we are led by your voice. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I thought I'd go back and I'd look at Stephen. Since the Christians were called, uh, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, and they went to Antioch after the, the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, I thought, you know, I want to go and read up on that story of Stephen. Y'all go with me to Acts chapter 6, if you would, please. So we're backtracking from where the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That happened in Acts chapter 11, and we're going back to chapter 6. This is when Stephen comes up, and it says, um, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we'll turn this responsibility over to them. Verse 5, this proposal pre uh, pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then it lists the others that they also chose. Go on down to 6 and verse 8. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Y'all say that with me. Say grace and power. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. He was full of grace and power. Now, if, if uh, y'all know me, us being family, most of what I guess... I would say my ministry up to this point has been surrounding grace. Next time you get a chance, just go back and listen to all my messages, just for how, how many hours that takes you, 10 or 20 hours, whatever it's been. And, uh, but I'll just summarize for you. It's been a lot about grace, mainly because probably I've been growing in grace. But uh, the Lord told me a while back, he said, I'm taking you another direction. He said, all right, not that we can ever, you know, expound enough on grace, but he says, 
I'm going to take you in another direction. So I, I said, okay, okay. And I, the last message I preached was about not just trying to do stuff to attain the label of a Christian. You know what I mean? But just being with, with Christ and just concentrating on him. Let his love, let us become full of his love. And then we just act towards others like he would act. And they'll say, that person is Christ-like. That person is anointed just like Jesus was. And they'll call us Christians. And when I was researching that, I came across this verse that says, Now Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. And it said he did great wonders amongst the people. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, My power goes with my grace. My power goes with my grace. Stephen was full of God's power because he was full of God's grace. And several times throughout the Word, we see God's grace and His power working together and mentioned together. When it talks about, when Paul talks about his thorn, that well-known passage of Scripture where Paul talks about a thorn, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, how's that? He said, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect uh, in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. This is Paul saying that. So that Christ's power may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, God's grace and his power go together because grace is all about him. Grace is the process of putting off yourself giving up on yourself and taking on Christ's image, taking on Christ's identity as your own, right? We are not righteous in ourselves. We have to put off our righteousness. Sister Pam said one time, and I loved it, she said, God can deal with unrighteousness, but he can't deal with self-righteousness. He has dealt with unrighteousness, but he cannot, and he never can deal with self-righteousness. Because as long as you're trying to rely on your own righteousness, he can't come and clothe you in the righteousness that he wants to give you. And so grace is all about removing yourself out of the equation and relying on on Christ. And like Paul said, when when his power does rest upon us, when we give up, when we are weak in ourselves, then he comes on us. Not only does he clothe us in his righteousness, but he gives us his power as well. Another time it talks about God's grace and his power. Y'all remember the story of the prodigal son? Sister Pam was preaching on it, touched on it. Said the, the, the son went out and wasted all the father's possessions. And when he came back, what did the father do? We know that the father represents God in the, in, the, in the parable, he says he'd seen him a far way off and he came running to him. And when he got there, what did he do? He put a robe on him. That's God's grace. That's his robe of righteousness that he clothes us in. And he put a ring on his finger. The ring is the authority and it's the power. There's God's grace and his power working together. Back in the olden days when a king would send a decree or something out to uh, the territories, he would send a messenger and he would take that big long scroll that the decree was written out on, they'd roll it up and they'd seal it with wax. And then to, to close that or to stamp that, he would make his seal his sig- with his signet ring that only the king had. And he would close that document up with that. So when the messenger delivered it and the recipient got it, they would look and they would recognize the seal of the king. And they said, whatever's inside that document carries the authority of the king because that's his signet ring. And that's what he did for the son. That's what he did for the wayward son. He put a ring on his finger. He said, not only do you have my righteousness, but you have my authority and my power. Woo. I like my own preaching. The Bible says that we're heirs and co-heirs with Christ. In Romans it says that. So that means that 
if I'm an heir and a co-heir, if you're an heir, Sister Pam, that means when your parents pass on that you'll have something to inherit from them. Well, if I'm a co-heir with Sister Pam, then that means whatever she's got coming to her, it's coming to me too. We're a co-heirs. If I'm your co-worker, Sarah, that means whatever you're doing, I'm probably doing alongside you. I got co-workers. They go out there and they build tires just like I do. If I'm a co-heir, I'm in line to inherit just like Jesus. Woo, that's exciting. That means we have access to the same thing that Jesus has access to. So what I want to do is I want us to go into the Scriptures together and see how we can have the same power that Jesus had. Jesus tells us, and I believe it's very clear if you look at Scripture, that we do have the same power that he had. But I think we've mistaken some of the things that he was trying to say, and, and we've caused confusion for ourselves and for other people. But we have the same power that he has. We're talking about being full of God's power and grace, because God's grace and power. Go to John chapter 16 with me, if you will, please. Woo! Verse 23. You ever hear somebody pray and they say, Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to do this, 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 and this, and this. In Jesus' name, amen. Why do we say in Jesus' name like that? Well, in John chapter 16 and verse 23. He says, in that day, you'll no longer ask me. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. He's talking about a day when he's gone and he's no longer here. He says, in that day, you'll no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Because, see, they were asking him. He was right there with them. They didn't have to ask in his name. He was right there. They could go directly to him. But instead, until now, you haven't asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. So we pray in Jesus' name. We want to pray, and we want our power, our, our prayers to, to uh, elicit action just like uh, Jesus did. We want to heal, and we want to see people recover, right? We want to pray, and we want to see the sick recover. We want to pray, and we want to see marriages heal. We want to, we want to, we want to pray, and we want to see God move things, right? then we've got to pray in Jesus' name. Well, how are we going to have the same power? If we are to have the same power that Jesus had, then we've got to operate the way Jesus operated. He said, Thy kingdom come. The disciples asked him, Lord, how should we pray? He said, Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He always put his will to the side and acted in alignment with the Father. Over and over, Jesus told the disciples that he was not operating under his own authority, but under authority from God the Father. He said that over and over. Just, just a few examples here. In John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. What? This is Jesus Christ we're talking about. It says, He's talking. He's speaking of himself. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only uh, he can do only what he sees his father doing. Wow, that's pretty strong. You see, Jesus also had to put off his own will, just like we do to receive his grace. Jesus had to put off his will and and take on the will of the Father. Matthew. Matthew says, going a little further in verse in uh, chapter twenty six and verse thirty nine, he says he fell onto his face. Uh, onto the ground and prayed my father if it's possible this was jesus in the garden of gethsemane may this cup be taken from me yet not as i will but as you will john chapter 5 verse 30 he said by myself i can do nothing i judge only as i hear and my judgment is just for i seek not to please myself but him who sent me and john chapter 6 verse 38 it says for i've come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me on and on and on. I've got five more, five more of them. I'll just give you one. Jesus said, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, in John chapter 8, verse 28, then you'll know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father's taught me. See, 
Jesus' authority came because he was under authority. He was under authority from another, yet he had the authority. How can he be under authority yet have authority? See, because authority has to be given. If I go in there and I and if I'm a dictator and I and I just go in there unlawfully and just make a war on somebody and just wipe the other country out, I can get power, but I don't have any authority. The people will never I may be able to rule over them. I may be able to subject them and hold them down, but I never really have any true power. Why? Because it was not given to me. The reason our president has power is because it's passed down from one to the next, to the next, to the next. The people gave the first president the power. And then after that, the president passes it from one president to the next. So the next president has all the same authority that the first president had because it was given to him. And what he told us to do was to operate in his same authority. He was telling us to operate in the same authority that he had. But what we've done is we've mistaken that he wants us to repeat a certain phrase. What we do is we, instead of subjecting our will to his, we want to subject his will to ours. And here's what typical prayers sound like. Lord, please give me that new thing I've been wanting. Lord, I really need you to do this. I need more money. I need a better job. Lord, this Friday night, she looks so beautiful. I'm going to ask her out, Lord Jesus. Please. Will you let her say yes? In Jesus' name. They're like, well, I said it. And then you sit back and you wait. Well, you know, and then you think, well, if it doesn't come true, I, I must, I, I did everything that he said, you know, so I just must be me. He just must not like me. But praying in Jesus' name is not about making a big, long list of our wants and our needs and our life and then just slapping the, oh, in Jesus' name on the end of it. What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? He told us to ask whatever we would in His name. He told us to pray in His name. And another place in Colossians, Paul said, And whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So if I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus, does, and I'm going to do everything in the name of Jesus, does that mean I go around saying, if I want to play the drums, do I say, I take these drums in the name of Jesus? If I'm going to walk out that door and I'm going to start my car, do I say, I start this car in the name of Jesus? Do you, if you do everything in the name of Jesus, do you just say, oh, I'm going to take this microphone in the name of Jesus? You don't go around your life just repeating that phrase, do you? So when he asked you to pray in the name of Jesus, how come we just say all those, all those things and then we say in the name of Jesus? Have I confused anybody yet? <laughs> so what's all this about doing things in the name of Jesus? Praying in the name of Jesus. Jesus even told us to baptize in the name, didn't he? In the name. Let's look into this. What, what is this in the name? If you look up name in dictionary.com where all the cool kids go for their dictionary, <laughs> for their dictionary needs, it's dictionary.com these days. Used to, it used to be Merriam-Webster's, you know, annotated dictionary and all that. That's old. That's going away. Well, it, you know, name is obviously what you're called by things like that but if you go on down it's got this phrase in it in the name of and it says 
with an appeal to, for example, in the name of mercy. Stop that screaming. With an appeal to. The next one says, by the authority of. Woo! It says, for example, you might say, open up in the name of the law. By the authority of the law, open up. On behalf of. If a criminal coming along and snatches an old lady's purse, right? And there he is making off with that purse. And a cop's walking the beat, and she says, help me. This guy's taking my purse, thief. The police said, oh, and there he is. He's already taking off. He runs after her. Ah! Come back here. Come back here. Well, the thief's got. A head start on him, right? He's going to get away. If it's because the officer himself don't have the strength to overcome him, to catch up with him. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, you're ahead of me. So what does he do? He's See, he can't do it in his own because he can't just catch up to the man. But what he can do is, he can go to something that's got a little bit higher authority than he does. Carries a little bit more weight than what he does. See, he's equipped with a gun, and he has all the authority based upon the law to use that gun and to apprehend that criminal no matter what it takes. Because the law says it's unlawful to take another uh, the, the lady's purse, right? So what does he do? He comes after her, he says, stop in the name of the law. And you hear that. How's it go? I don't know how I don't know anything about guns. <laughs> you hear that click? He says, Stop in the name of the law. That is under the authority of the law that I have. Because see, the police officer is working under delegated authority from the law that was written, that was given to him by the people who elected the officials, who wrote the laws, who instituted a police force, who gave them the authority to act in that law. And what he does is he's got that hand on the trigger, and if he doesn't, if the criminal does not submit, he's got all the authority of the law to inject a little bit of extra power into that situation. In the name of the law. Queens and kings would do this. They'd go arrest somebody. You're right under arrest in the name of the Queen of England. It's under the authority of. It's not just about saying pray in the name of Jesus. 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 We have the victory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Satan will have to flee. Why? Because we said in the name of Jesus? No, because we're operating under the authority of Christ's power. Are y'all still on John chapter 16, verse 23? I want to read that full, that full scripture now. It says, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Whatever you ask under my authority, whenever you come as me, representing my interests and my uh, wants and my desires, when you come to the Father in Jesus' authority, as Jesus would come to the Father, then you will receive whatever you ask. It says, until now you've not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but I'll tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. Woo! It says, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. He's not saying I'll ask the Father for you. He's not saying come to me and ask Jesus and Jesus will ask the Father for you. He said no. I'm not saying that I'll ask the Father on your behalf. 
Verse 27 says, no, the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and you have believed that I came from God. See, we speak directly to the Father in the name of Jesus, under the authority of Jesus. What Jesus was trying to tell the disciples was, look, I I've been right here with you, right? And you've been able to ask me for whatever you needed. But I'm going to be leaving soon, okay? And that time, you're not going to pray to me anymore. You're not going to have to ask me anymore. You're going to pray directly to the Father and pray to the Father in my authority, in alignment with my wishes, and it'll be done for you because he loves you just like he loves me. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. See? So when we're going to pray in Jesus' name or we're going to act in Jesus' name, it's under his authority. It's we're appealing to his authority. So when I see sickness come upon my brother or my sister, and there's nothing that I can do about it because I'm not a doctor, and even the doctor's own best imaginations can only do you so far. But see, there, there's a higher, higher power that we've got our hand on the trigger of that we can release into that situation, and we can pray for healing under the authority of Jesus Christ. Christ and it can happen you see what I'm saying see when we see when I see the enemy attacking relationships there's nothing that I can do sister Pam's a wonderful counselor but even her knowledge is limited even her abilities can't do it all the way you might be able to chase after the problem you might be able to get somewhere and do some things on your own but there comes a time where you have to appeal to a higher authority and you have to know that you got your hand on the trigger of a loaded gun with a weapon that possesses more power than you possess on your own and you can say in Jesus name get out of my marriage get Get out of my relationships. You don't have any place here. And because you're acting under the authority of Jesus Christ, you have the power of what you pray, what you speak. You guys have the power. You have the power, the same power that Jesus had when you pray and when you speak under his authority and in, line, in alignment with his wishes and his desires. Jesus said in John chapter 14, this is this famous passage where it says, As I have loved you, love one another. This is how they'll know that you're my disciples, that you show love one for another. And he said, Those who love me will keep my commands. This was this famous passage and right after that he says all this i have spoken while still with you this is in john chapter 14 verse 25 he says all this is i've spoken while still with you but the advocate the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that i've said to you I misread that before. I thought it said the advocate who I will send in my name. But it says the advocate who the Father will send in my name. So now that you guys are progressing in this lesson, what does it mean when it says that the Father is going to send the advocate in Jesus' name? It means that the Holy Spirit is under the authority of Jesus. Brother David. Can you help me? I should have done this before. Can you help me with that board there, brother? Can we just set it up right along in here? The one right right there. He says, he says, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Advocate, in my name. So Jesus was under the authority of God, right? We went over that. All those verses, he says, I don't do anything unless what I see my Father do. Jesus then said, that the Father was going to send the Advocate in His name and His authority. And it says that the Advocate will teach you and remind you of everything I've said to you. Thank you, brother. So Jesus has gone away now, right? Jesus has gone away. And he's left us the Holy Spirit. And he teaches us. He reminds us of everything that Jesus said. 
and he has he carries the same authority that Jesus carried. Y'all get that? So when you are acting in the Holy Spirit, you know, the Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God, are the children of God. When we are obedient to the to the moving of the Holy Spirit, we are operating in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus delegated that authority to him. Remember how we said that not only did Jesus, you know, repeatedly say that he was operating or listening to what the Father would say? Who's ever heard this? You don't have to raise your hand, but I think some of y'all heard this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's Jesus speaking. Some of you are nodding your heads. It was given. Remember, it was given. He didn't take it. It was given. It was passed to him. He said the Holy Spirit would have the same, and he asked us to pray in the name. Right there in that famous verse where it says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I was watching a Christian comedian, and he said, in order to keep the people's attention, every so often you have to say, I'm about to close. <laughs> now I'm thinking to close here in just a minute. <laughs> so I, I'm fixing to close here. I want y'all to go with me to one more scripture. Matthew chapter 28. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he said the preachers he was growing up under, they always about to close like three or four different times. I'm thinking to close here. He, he said he was a child. He didn't know what that meant. He said, how many doors has this guy opened in this message? <laughs> verse 18, 28 and 18 of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, here we go, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you know that is the last words of the Gospel of Matthew? I am with you even to the end of the age. The next recorded action that we have from Jesus is him is the ascension in Acts. And he, uh, he told them to go and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? Yet the disciples in the book of Acts, every recorded baptism that is recorded in the New Testament was either was done in the name of Jesus Or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there's this huge confusion in the body of Christ. Well, what do we say when we baptize somebody? What have you been baptized? How were you baptized? How, how were you baptized? Were you baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Or were you baptized? And I, I, I didn't know anything about this confusion. I didn't know anything about it. Well, I'll tell you what. I came to our church, and I tell you what, I was so blessed. I'm telling you what, y'all, if y'all even knew half of my testimony, I could run around this whole building on what the Lord's done in my life. So my parents were just happy to see me in church. <laughs> Let's put it that way <laughs> at this point. You know, I have gone from being the black sheep of the family, man. I tell you what, my sisters, they're all got high degrees and they, they one's a doctor one's a teacher you know i was feeling like i didn't really measure up you know i didn't have lots of check marks in my column but you know what i did i went and i got him a grandchild and i become a preacher and now i'm right back up on top <laughs> ah, i try to top that sister 
I don't see no little babies running around your house. <laughs> I was sitting around talking with my parents one day, and they said, well, how do y'all baptize? And I said, well, we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, just like they did in Acts. <gasps> what? I said, yeah. I, like I said, I didn't know this was any big deal. Yeah, we baptized just like they did in Acts. My mom looked flabbergasted. She went white as a sheet. She looked over at my dad and she said, Honey, would you ever believe our son has become a oneness preacher? <laughs> I said, what, is it? what does that mean? You only baptize in the name of Jesus. You're oneness. So now that I'm aware of this, two schools of thought, I just go with it. Because I've learned to detect, you know. Somebody says, y'all believe in the Trinity over there? Oh, yeah, we're big Trinity believers over here. <laughs> Somebody says, you believe Jesus is the only way to be saved, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, we just, Jesus only over there at our church over there. And what, I mean, am I Trinitarian? Am I Unitarian? Am I oneness? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just, whatever you want me to be, I'll be. But look, Jesus was not trying to throw everyone into confusion. And there is no confusion. That's right. Somebody said, well, he, he knew he was going to. Okay, y'all check this out. Here we got Jesus, right? Jesus said he operated under the authority of God the Father. Jesus then told the disciples when he leaves, the Father was going to send the Holy Spirit who would come in the name of Jesus under the authority of Jesus. I want to write Holy Spirit. My grandmother would be incensed. It's the Holy Ghost to her. Uh, Jesus received his authority from God the Father. He said the Holy Spirit would come under his authority. And then he said the Holy Spirit would teach us and remind us. And that we, we would be led by the Spirit. So let's say us. Here we are. And this is Jesus over here. For Jesus to tell them to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus told them to baptize under the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Is no conflict, is not a conflict whatsoever. They are all operating under the same authority. Jesus told us that. He said, the authority that I have comes from my Father. There's no, there's no conflict whatsoever for Jesus to say, go and baptize. Because, see, that, I told you that was the last recorded act of the gospel. The next one was he left and he ascended. So he, at that point, the Holy Spirit was here. And they would be acting under the authority of the Holy Spirit, which is under the authority of Jesus, which he said was under the authority of God himself. There's no confusion whatsoever or conflict in the word. And matter of fact, it's homogenous and it's, and it's perfectly beautiful. For us to baptize in the name of Jesus, it carries all the authority of any of these. It's all the same authority. It carries the same weight. And we all caught up, whether we're praying or we're baptizing or whatever we're doing, and did I say the name? What was said? I'm much more concerned that the person baptizing you is operating in some sort of authority because they don't have any authority to baptize you. They don't have any authority to raise you up in newness of life. That authority can only come from Jesus Christ. I'm much more concerned that we're acting and we're operating under the authority of Christ than what particular phrase we say. Now, it's just like, if I, would I preach, uh, if I would look and I would recommend for you 
how you ought to live your life, what would be the biggest blessed life, the most blessed life that you could live? If I'm a full believer in grace, or if I'm a legalistic preacher that says you need to do this, this, and this to receive the blessing of, of God, the things that we probably wind up doing or that we quote-unquote should do, let's say that just for our religious minds to comprehend it, they might be the same thing. They might be the same thing. might look a lot alike, you know. A blessed life here, and people take their model of a blessed life, and they say this is what you got to do. But if I'm preaching this because you have to do this because uh, God is going to be mad at you, and this is a sin, this is a sin, and this is a sin, it totally misses the point. But if you're doing this, your life might look the same way, but it's the motive. Why are you doing that? Why do you want to live a blessed life? Why do you want to avoid these things? Why do you want to avoid these tra entrapments and addictions and, and bad habits? Why? Because you're in love with Jesus Christ and his love, and you're taking on his love, and you want to be just a, a reflection of him. But over here, you're doing it for the totally wrong reason. I'm not saying that we're going to change baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe this 100%, but it's the motive. Why are we saying we baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ? Why would we want to baptize anybody in any name? Because it's under the authority of Jesus Christ. Why would I pray? Why would I say anything in the name of Jesus Christ? Why would I do anything in the name of Jesus Christ? Because it's his authority. And Jesus told us to operate under his authority. Whatever we do, Whatever he, we do. You know, Jesus went about, it says, healing. And I can never get over this in my spirit. It says, healing those that were in great pain. It said, Jesus went about healing those that were in great pain. That's totally not in my notes. It just freestyled that off the top of my head. But it says, he, he went about healing those that were in great pain. And you know, our lives are to be a model, to be an example, to be modeled after the life of Jesus. We've got people in great pain around us. And it's not just physical pain. It's hurts and it's wounds and it's, it's, it's stress and strife and all sorts of things that, that need us. And they need an authority. They need, they need Jesus. They need the kingdom to be injected into those situations. And we are the conduit through which his will enters this world. How are we going to walk under his authority? Doing something in the name of Jesus is not about saying in the name of Jesus over our wishes. But it's about coming in alignment with his wants, his wishes, his desires. And knowing that you're a child of God that carries all the same weight and the same power as the authority that he had. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus would steal away. He would pull back. And it said he would go into lonely places. And he would pray. And I believe it was in those times. You know, in Mark, it says very early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up and left the house. Sometimes it's a lonely place to be with God. You know, sometimes it's not uh, in all the wonderful things in life. Sometimes you're not surrounded by friends and family. Sometimes you feel all alone. Mark 6, it says, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. In Luke 5, it says, often Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke chapter 6 says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the whole night praying to God. And it says, when Judas met Jesus, it said Judas knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And if you read in that passage, he was praying. He had just now come from prayer. He left the three there and he'd gone on further and come back and three times they were sleeping on him and he came back and right then it said as he was speaking Judas came if we're going to have grace and power like Stephen had we're going to operate in grace and power 
I think the key to it is, first of all, knowing, knowing what it means to operate in Jesus' name, knowing that you have the same authority, Sarah, that you have the same authority, Phyllis. Each and every one of you carries the same authority that he had, not because you've usurped it and you've just taken it on your own, but because he gave it to you. It says so in the scriptures. And second of all, to spend time meditating with him, spend time talking with him, spend time in a relationship with him, spend time secluded. You know how Pam and Gary know one another so well? Because they spend time away, secluded. They got to take that time, any successful relationship, you got to take that time where it's just you and them. Sometimes you might want to go fishing, Gary. Sometimes you might want to do this, you might want to do that. But to have a successful relationship, you say, you know what, I'm going to put some of that aside. I'm not going to go out with the boys tonight. I'm going to stay home, and I'm just going to enjoy my wife. I'm just going to be with my wife, and just gonna, we're just going to talk. We're just going to get to know one another better in a deeper way, you know? And it's the same way. I mean, I, I tell you what, w- I, I haven't escaped loneliness in this life. I haven't escaped, and none of you will. None of you will. But I'm telling you what, some of those lonely times, it's just like Jesus. He says often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Some of those times are where we can just get with just get with our Father. Just say, Lord, what is your will? What is what do you want for this situation? What do you want for my family? What do you want for my job? How can I how can I be blessed in my finances? And the Lord will show you and He will reveal to you His Spirit, His His will. So that then you can go forth and you can come out of that and you can operate in power and authority for those around you that are in severe pain. And I wonder this morning, you know, if we could just take some time and just spend some time with the Father. You know, it. there's the disciples spent time with Jesus. And you know what he did in the New Testament? He constantly went about trying to reveal himself to those that were closest to him every time they were with him he would say if you've seen me you've seen the father he was trying to tell his identity to them and that's the thing same thing that he will do for us when we spend time with him in close relationship with him he will reveal himself to us he will reveal himself to you he'll reveal things to you so that you can go and you can walk and you can act in his authority and in his name